morning when that go. Nice to see you always. Good morning. Hey, sir. Okay, how are you? Let's give it uh, another minute or two, and then we'll get going. Thankfully, Perna had me up nice and early this morning with a patient. So I feel like it's 11 a.m. <laughs> All right. Uh, another minute and we'll get going. Hey, so how are you? Good morning, Dr. Pass. Okay. Okay, yes, uh, we have a large enough number of fellows we can just get going. So thank you for joining this morning. And thank you to Perna, who's been dealing with the problem all morning. So thank you. Okay, this is a 20 year old with a history of CHF who is um, on uh, medication for this. So, um, Anybody have any thoughts on what could be wrong uh, with this patient? I'll tell you that the, the medicines the patient's on is uh, Lasix, Enalapril, and Digoxin. So uh, why don't we start with Dr. Lawalia? Do you have any thoughts on what could be going on here? Morning, Dr. Bass. <clears throat> I think um, the PR, PR interval is long and um, the QRS is wide also. Um, the QT looks normal. Um, so this could be uh, digoxin toxicity or like overdose. That's correct. But I would say that the QT interval is normal, but the QT is not normal, right? I mean, this is not a normal looking QT, right? Right, sorry, QT intervals, yeah. So this is what they call the classic scooped out ST segment of digoxin toxicity, so scooping it out. Um, and um, uh, so these are the various things you can get from digoxin. You can get an ATAC with AV block. You can get third degree block. I've seen that with acute overdoses. You can get all kinds of ectopic rhythms like flutter, fib, or VT. You can get junctional tachycardias, uh, sustained VT, VF, basically any arrhythmia is possible with digoxin. Um, so just sort of, uh, I think this is a nice tracing of uh, digoxin toxicity. We don't see it as much anymore because quite frankly, don't use digoxin as much anymore. And we don't load people with digoxin as much as we used to, but something to keep in mind. Uh, and uh, some of the signs and symptoms uh, are vomiting, nausea, anorexia, diarrhea. The most common is nausea and vomiting. Um, you can have headache, fatigue, disorientation. The classic description is seeing yellow or green halos around images or lights. Just definitely a altered perception of color is very commonly uh, re re reviewed. 
And then, uh, as we just said, lots of different tachycardias. The most important, though, is heart block. And as you saw in that tracing, there was a first degree heart block. And, um, and it's thought to be mostly due to very enhanced vagal effects of digoxin. So it's a nice, uh, nice thing to remember and something we don't see that often. It used to be very common you would see it because in the era before there was unit dosing and before there were computerized systems to order, which would put hard stops, which now put hard stops in if you order the wrong dose. A uh, very common error that was that a uh, patient would get 10 times the dose of digoxin because the fact that it is dosed in micrograms versus milligrams. And so uh, that was a very typical problem. I would say for the first 10 years of my career, it happened roughly once a year in every hospital I've worked in, but including during fellowship. But uh, it's very uncommon these days, but still is possible, obviously. Of course, if someone goes into renal failure, they can uh, develop digoxin toxicity as well. All right, so uh, I thought I would go over this ablation that we did recently. This is a 12-year-old with a history of recurrent SVT for a year um, and has had a number of episodes that have required intravenous adenosine to terminate the tachycardia. So here we are in sinus rhythm. And, um, you know, there was some, some discussion in the cath lab at the time that perhaps in lead one, this may look like pre-excitation. But um, I think in the other leads, you could see that the PR interval was uh, longer. And we'll look at the intracardiacs in order to tell what's going on. Okay, so uh, let's just go over the legend on the left. So the top four leads are uh, surface electrocardiogram leads, leads 1, F, V1, and 6. And every lab does it differently. So always when you're looking at, uh, at these types of tracings, you want to look at the left side in order to know your legend because everything is displayed differently in every single laboratory. In our lab, just for ease, we leave the map or the distal ablation and proximal ablation on the screen all the time, even at times when we're not doing any ablating at all. And that's simply because it's just easier not to have to change the page. Disadvantage, of course, is we're using up important real estate on the screen with that, but it's not a big deal. We have a high RA catheter, which in this particular example is, uh, is red. Uh, we have the His channels. We have distal His, mid His, and proximal His. And then in this particular case, we have five coronary sinus pairs going from the proximal coronary sinus to the distal coronary sinus. Finally, we have a right ventricular apical catheter. And then uh, this is the stim channel. Some computer systems will not tell us when we're stimulating or pacing. In this particular case, this computer does. And so uh, this is notated by the letters S1 and they correspond to A pacing. So, here we are, we're rapid atrial pacing at cycle length 570. And we see here a very nice AH and HV. Um, and that alone tells us that we are not pre-excited because we can see that the HV interval is normal in appearance. So there is no pre-excitation. And as we move farther out the coronary sinus pairs, we notice that the ventricular electrogram, which are these, are getting later and later. This one looks a little earlier, but it probably reflects the fact that it's not touching the myocardium that well for whatever reason. Here we are, we're pacing and now at cycle length 500. So when we do EP studies, generally I like to do every case the same way and there is no right way as long as you don't forget to do things in the study. So my particular bias is to first start with rapid atrial pacing. And the purpose of this is to assess how does the AV node respond to uh, atrial pacing, and also to get a baseline in terms of how well does the AV node conduct. This is important, particularly in cases where we might be burning near the AV node. You sort of want to know how you started the case. So here we are, we're pacing at uh, 500 milliseconds. And I think to your mind's eye, if you look at the 570, and then the 500, they look fairly similar in terms of the AH and the HV intervals. Here we are now uh, 50 milliseconds faster, cycle length 450. And so David, uh, how would I know what the heart rate is at cycle length 450? How would you calculate that? You take um, 60,000 and divide that by uh, 450 
So that's a heart rate of 133. And um, so here we are, and we're starting to see the suggestion that the PR interval is lengthening. If we look at this PR versus say the one at the start, I think you could in your mind's eye say that the PR looks a little shorter. Also, if we look at the AH interval here at 570, and then we move up to the, uh, the 450, we see that the AH is starting to get a little longer. Interestingly, the time from the stimulation impulse till the hiss is also getting longer, demonstrating that in the atrial myocardium, there is decremental conduction as well. So as we're getting faster with the rapid atrial pacing, we're seeing a longer stimulation to atrial uh, timing. Okay. Now we're at cycle length 400 or a rate of 150 beats per minute. And uh, we're starting to see slowly that the uh, A to H interval is lengthening even more. Um, again, if we sort of in our minds, I think of this A H interval and then compare it to when we were at, uh, at 570, I think you would agree that this A H interval looks a fair bit shorter than uh, the one here that we have at 400. It's a little bit longer. Now, some, this is still a very reasonable AH interval. It doesn't look very long. If I were guessing, I'm gonna guess it's about 80 to 90 milliseconds. And that's because this is a young, healthy person who has normal AV node conduction. Now, on the left-hand side of the screen, we have cycle length 370. And here, Josie is starting to pace a little faster. So by the right-hand side of the screen, we're at cycle length 360. So, um, Let's go back to David. David, what do you think is happening here between uh, 370 and 360, and how would you explain this? So it seems like by the um, the second to last beat of the page here, I'm not seeing the um, P wave before our QRS complex, um, and it seems like the PR interval is progressively um, getting longer. It's like a Wenkebocking um, mm -hmm. until we have a dropped. Um, I don't see the P wave before that second to last QRS there. Well, remember, you do have intracardiac channels. So I, I actually think it's great that you're looking at the surface ECG because that's always very, very helpful. In this particular case, though, uh, it's hard to see the P waves because the PR interval is getting so long, right, that the P wave is being superimposed on the T wave. Um, also, the paper speed is at 100 mil millimeters per second, as opposed to a normal ECG where it's 25. So it's a little hard to tell. But if you look in the intracardiac, can you make any comments regarding whether there's a P wave before every QRS or an atrial depolarization before every QRS? Yeah, I mean, now I'm looking at the HISS, um, mm -hmm. the HISS leads right now. Um, and I, I mean, I do see one before every one, I believe, but it's just very, very long. Um, That's right. The uh, A to H interval in the last two. That's exactly especially. very well stated. So if we look on the left-hand side, we see this is the A to H interval, right? That I'm pointing to here. And then as David astutely points out, when we get to the right-hand side of the screen, the A H interval is lengthening quite substantially. And so, this could be an example of, um, of someone who is about to wanky bock. Um, uh, what else, what would also be another possible explanation for why the AH, it almost looks as if the AH has jumped out, right? It got quite a bit longer from, you know, in really a matter of three beats, it's gone from a normal AH interval to a very abnormal one. Is there, so this could just represent normal decrement of the AV node, but is there any other possible diagnosis that might explain this? Could we have a um, you know a blocked beat already, um, and then a you know a junctional escape beat? It's possible, but it really does look as if there is actually an atrial depolarization before every single uh, ventricular depolarization. Sometimes the coronary sinus leads are the easiest to tell in although they're very strange looking. So this is the atrial depolarization. This is the ventricular depolarization. We see that there's an A before every single V, but as you astutely pointed out, the A to V time or the PR interval or the AH interval is clearly lengthening substantially. 
So let's go on and see what happens when we get just a little bit faster, a little bit shorter AH interval. So here we are. And now Josie is pacing at cycle length 340. So we're close to 160 beats per minute. Um, let's see, uh, Jenna, do you have any thoughts on uh, how to explain what's going on in this tracing, what this, this may represent? All right, so uh, I'm looking at the uh, his signal um, or channel and it looks like the a H is actually very short here. Uh, sort of it transitions after the one, two, three, four, five, sort of, it seems like it's getting shorter. Like, yeah, right there. Uh -huh. um, so well, I think. I just remember that we're mm -hmm. actually at a, at a shorter cycle length. So at a faster rate, just to remind mm -hmm. you, this is uh, at cycle length. 360. We have a fairly long AH interval. Now we're at 340, and you're saying that the AH or the AV interval is actually very short. Is there another explanation that could explain this? Sort of the opposite of what you just said? The possible that this is um, a longer AV interval. Let me see. Like that it's actually conducting to the to the further beat. Is yeah. that what you're, yeah. That's what I'm trying to suggest. Mm -hmm. So this is actually an example of, let's see if this is the tracing that I, okay, so here we are now at uh, cycle length 330, it's basically the same tracing. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm measuring first the uh, PR interval, which is measured, or the equivalent of the PR interval, it's really the AV interval from the onset of the pacing spike in the high RA to the onset of the QRS. And that interval is 350 milliseconds, okay? I'm also measuring though the R to R interval from the onset of the QRS to the onset of the QRS, which is in this case, 340 milliseconds. And so in this example, what we actually see is that the PR interval is longer than the RR interval. And uh, that would be consistent with the diagnosis of dual AV node physiology. Okay, so when you're doing rapid atrial pacing, so we've talked in the past that one of the ways to tell if you have the most classic way to tell if you have dual AV node physiology is to do atrial extra stimulus testing. And when you come down by a 10 millisecond uh, decrement, which is standard, remember we pace eight beats at a certain cycle length, and then we put in an extra stimulus 10 milliseconds earlier and earlier, we see an increase in the AH interval by up to 50 milliseconds for every 10 millisecond decrement. When you see uh, more than a 50 millisecond decrement for one 10 millisecond drop, we would call that dual AV node physiology. Another way to make this diagnosis of dual AV node physiology is this example here, which is that if the if the PR interval with rapid atrial pacing is actually longer than the R to R interval, this would also be a, a diag would be diagnostic of the presence of dual AV node physiology. So what's actually happening here is that this pacing spike, and there's an A buried in here, it's probably, you could see it a little bit over here, is conducting all the way to here. And the reason you don't see the Hiss is because the next pacing spike is basically simultaneous with the patient's intrinsic Hiss. <coughs> so, right, this, Jenna was correct in saying that the AV time seems very, very short here, but we know physiologically, it is not possible to conduct to the, through the AV node or even through an accessory pathway at such a short AV interval. So what this is, is actually, a uh, very long PR interval or first degree heart block related to going down the slow pathway after the fast pathway has blocked. So we're going again, we're pacing the A, the A is sort of buried in here somewhere. A, there's an H that you can sort of see the H starting just before the artifact of the pacing spike and then the V of the next QRS. So this, this A is conducting through the Hiss to this V, this A, which is, you can see, superimposed on the QRS and the Hiss, is conducting down to this V here. So this is a so-called sustained slow pathway conduction uh, consistent with dual AV node physiology. 
is a nice, this is a very nice example of this. And uh, then uh, after Josie turned off the rapid atrial pacing, we saw the, this. So let me see um, if Dr. Uh, Kong has any thoughts on what arrhythmia this could be. I should tell you, it's hard to tell because we're on, uh, I didn't show you how fast this is, but this is oh, a hard I see that he's in a comedy club. That wasn't for me, but. <laughs> um, so you said we, the paper speed, we can't see we're for at, sure. But well, we're at a, I didn't show you the cycle length, but let's assume for the sake of discussion that the heart rate is, and this rhythm is 185 beats per minute. Okay. Um, we do have a very close AMV. And given the evidence of everything that we looked at so far, I think we could say that this is um, AVNRT. That's right. So oh, this actually, is, um, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I apologize. Sorry. On the surface EKG, it looks like I thought I saw a P that's um, further away than the AMV on the um, intracardiac leads, but actually I think, I wonder if it's a T wave. That's probably it. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, it's a good question. I assume you're referring to this, is that? Yes, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, our surface ECG in the lab is lousy. There's a lot of artifact on it. Um, this doesn't seem like it would be a T wave because this QT is fairly long. Uh, I think this is honestly artifact, to be truthful, but it's, it's a little confusing. Um, so what we're seeing here is, uh, that the, uh, there's an A, he, so remember this is spontaneous rhythm, we're not pacing, and you can tell that by looking in the stim channel and you don't see any stimulation artifact here. And so this is going down the slow pathway with a long AH interval, and then up the fast pathway uh, with a very short ventricular atrial time. And remember that in AVNRT, the atrial electrogram could even precede the onset of the HIS. Um, and then we go down again, the slow pathway, up the fast pathway and down and onward and onward. Now, um, are there any other possible arrhythmia that this could be? Could this be ORT, Grace? It, mm, I guess, yeah, it could be. I couldn't say no from just this. Well, um, what, uh, it's possible, but very unlikely. What is the normal R to P interval with somebody who is in OR? Uh -oh. <laughs> it would be long uh, that's RP. Right. So go greater than 40 milliseconds. Uh, that's right. Actually, greater than 70 milliseconds. Oh, 70. Really, mm -hmm. uh, the line in the sand, as it were. So um, yeah, so this is a little strange, right, um, for ORT. Could it be uh, an EAT? With the, you wouldn't expect the PR to be, mm, yeah, I don't think I would expect the PR to be affected in EAT. Actually, uh, EAT often is associated with the presence of first degree heart block. Uh, that's often. Uh -huh clinical pearl when you're mm -hmm. someone is in EAT is if the PR interval is long, that's often the case in EAT, not 100%, but often. So this could be an EAT. This could be any primary atrial arrhythmia as well. This could be uh, atrial flutter. This could be EAT. This could be some kind of, um, yeah, those, or it would be avian RT. The fact that this started with pacing uh, is more suggest and started suddenly is sort of makes EAT seem less likely, right? Because EAT is a so-called automatic arrhythmia, which sort of warms up and cools down. So it's a little unusual for this type of arrhythmia to be starting with that type of arrhythmia to start with pacing. So the fact that the VA interval or the R to P interval is so short makes, if this is in a, if this is a re-entrant arrhythmia, which seems likely given that it started with pacing acutely and suddenly, 
um, and that the patient has a history of having tachycardia terminate with adenosine on more than one occasion. Um, we still went through one more exercise to prove that this was in fact AVNRT. Well, first of all, how would you prove, what would be an easy way to say that this was AVNRT versus EAT or atrial flutter? What could you do to distinguish those two? Hmm. Thinking. Well, what would happen if you gave a denison to someone? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, if it was, it was ORT a or AVNRT, it would be um, it would be terminated, but not as if it's like causing block in the AV node. Uh, that's correct. Uh, what would happen if it were EAT usually? Would not terminate. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, it would. It would terminate. No, no. In EAT, you usually do not terminate with uh, with adenosine. You can, but it's extremely unusual. What about atrial flutter? What would not. happen if you gave uh, adenosine to this patient with atr if, um, atrial flutter? Uh, would not terminate. Right, because adenosine only has an impact on the AV node, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so you would get a lot of A's at the same exact rate, but the ventricular rate would slow, right? Because you would cause transient heart block. Um, yes. So you have atrium going still at 185 beats per minute, but the ventricle at a much slower rate. So we actually had given adenosine uh, at one point during the case because uh, we were having a transient problem with our stimulator and we weren't able to pace terminate it at the very start of the case, which thankfully we were able to solve. Um, so we knew that this arrhythmia broke with adenosine. So that kind mm -hmm. of had a lot of primary atrial arrhythmias. But in order to sort of lock down the diagnosis of this being AVNRT, what we did was we placed a PVC during what is referred to as hysrefractoriness. So, um, so what I'm doing here is I'm measuring from the last hiss to the next hiss, and there is a pacing spike here. You can see a subtle difference in the QRS. We're mm -hmm. pacing the ventricle at exactly the moment that the hiss is fired. Now, placing a PVC during hiss refractoriness is a standard electrophysiological test that is aimed at deciding whether this is orthodromic reentry, meaning that we're going down the AV node and up an accessory pathway, or AV nodal reentry and tachycardia. Now, why does this matter? Well, remember that in AVNRT, all of the reentry is occurring at a level above the Hiss bundle, okay? So if I were just assume that somebody has, um, has is in sinus rhythm, if I pace the ventricle, uh, we can see ventriculoatrial conduction in virtually everybody, right? We get, um, and the way that that works, if you don't have an accessory pathway, is you go through the his Purkinje system retrograde, you hit the bundle of his, it goes retrograde through the his, then it goes retrograde through the AV node, and then it goes to the atrium. That's how we get ventriculoatrial conduction. Now, let's assume that somebody has uh, orthodromic reentry. Now you're going down the AV node, then you're coming up the accessory pathway, back to the atrium, and then down the AV node again. If I were to pace the ventricle at precisely the moment that the bundle of Hiss fired, that would mean that the Hiss is refractory because it has just depolarized antegrade. Therefore, um, if you were in ORT and you were going up an accessory pathway and I paced the ventricle earlier, meaning at the time that the Hiss bundle fired, then the next atrial depolarization ought to be earlier as well because the ventriculoatrial impulse will be earlier through the accessory pathway. In other words, I'm depolarizing the ventricle earlier than it normally would depolarize on its own in ORT by pacing at the time that the Hiss bundle fired rather than waiting until the ventricle depolarized. Therefore, a Hiss refractory PVC during orthodromic reentry will cause the next atrial electrogram to be early. However, if somebody has AVNRT and you put a Hiss bundle uh, refractory PVC in, 
because the His bundle is the gateway between the ventricle and the atrium, and because the reentry in the AV node is occurring above the level of the His bundle, a His refractory PVC has no way to reset the timing in the atrium because the only way to go from ventricle to atrium is through the bundle of His. And if the bundle of His has just fired, then what's going on in the AV node in the atrium should just continue exactly on time uh, as before. And so what we're looking at when we put a PVC in during his refractoriness is to see what happens to the next atrial depolarization. Specifically, is it on time or is it early? If it's early, then it means that there's an accessory pathway. If it's on time, then it means that the patient has uh, AVNRT. So let's see what happened in this case. We think this patient has AVNRT because we have demonstrated the presence of dual AV node physiology. That's evidence statement number one. We have a, uh, a short RTP interval in tachycardia, uh, shorter than should be physiologically allowable. Um, that's evidence piece number two. We have the notion or the knowledge that giving adenosin in this arrhythmia terminates the arrhythmia, thus ruling out a number of primary atrial arrhythmias. So you could argue that, that all those alone have demonstrated that the patient has AVNRT. But in this case, because the patient easily went into AVNRT, which was sustained, we were able to do this last maneuver, which is again, a his refractory PVC. So first thing we're doing is we're measuring from the prior his to the next HIS in order to see if this PVC was occurring at the time that the HIS bundle fired. And in this case, it is. Now, the reason that we're doing this is that we, we are not able to tell the computer to put the PVC in at the time of the HIS. It can't sense that well. So what we do is we randomly put in PVCs one after the other, progressively 10 milliseconds earlier and earlier. And then we post hoc and analyze to make sure or see if one of them has fallen at exactly the time that the hiss has fired. And in this case, this is almost, almost exactly at that time. So we show that this PVC did randomly fall on the hiss. So now let's see what happens to the atrial depolarization. And what we see here is that when I measure from the A in the high RA to the next A in the high RA, they are exactly on time. Um, and uh, so that suggests that Again, that a His refractory PVC did not change the timing of the atrium, meaning that this has to be AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. Does that make sense? It's a very nice and elegant demonstration of uh, how you can prove that someone has AVNRT. Okay. So um, when we induced tachycardia later, we saw this. Um, and I will just tell you for the sake of discussion that the rate of these days is 185 beats per minute. Does anybody have any idea uh, what this might be? Let me ask uh, Sergey, do you have any thoughts on, uh, definitely looks right, like there are more, more A's than V's. Yes, I was just looking at it. Twice more A's than V's. Correct. So it's some kind of, but I still see that the A's are coming. Oh no, it's a measure. So that must be some kind of two to one conduction. Yes, correct, it is. Um, that's right. So what this is actually, is this is two to one AVNRT. This is a very a nice demonstration of something we don't see very often, but occasionally do. So uh, this was actually with ventricular extra stimulus testing. So we put in a PVC, we have VA conduction through the fast pathway with a relatively short VA interval. Then we have conduction down the slow pathway, up the fast pathway, uh, down the slow pathway with a long AB or AH time but notice that we don't get a V. Um, and that's because the his Purkinje system is not as robust as the uh, atrial myocardium. And so what's happening is remember that the AV node is re-entering above the level of the his. And so every time it re-enters, 
the atrium passively depolarizes and the ventricle can passively depolarize. But in, at the beginning of the induction, what we see is that the, uh, the, the his Purkinje system is not quite ready for every single reentry of the um, AV node. And so what we're seeing is one-to-one -one, uh, AV node to atrium conduction, but only two-to-one AV node to the ventricle. And so we're seeing a slow pathway. This is the A and the His on top. And we see that the A is actually the earliest because we're in AVNRT, so we're closest to the His. Then we go down the slow pathway, A, H, V, and we see a V this time, retrograde A, A, H, no V, A, H, V, retrograde up the fast pathway, slow pathway, A, H, no V, and so on and so forth. Eventually, the as you see at the, at the right-hand side, the uh, Hisperkinji system sort of wakes up and now we're starting to go one-to-one. -one. And you notice that the atrial rate is exactly the same and slowly the ventricular rate catches up. And so this is a very nice example of two-to-one going to one-to-one -one AVNRT. Okay. So we make the diagnosis of AVNRT and we uh, set up our catheter in the lowest third of Koch's triangle and we turn on RF current and um, why don't I ask Dr. Uzo what she thinks might be going on here? And I'll just show you this yellow arrow denotes when the radio frequency current was turned on. Okay. I'm asking mostly, what are you seeing over here? What's, what's going on here? So... The um, HV seems to widen. HV, okay. Uh, let me see. I'm sorry, the H interval. Okay, that's uh, that's possibility. Certainly, we are seeing. It's hard to tell, right? Because there's all this electrical noise on the uh, His catheter. But what would we like to see when we're doing a, a, a radio frequency current a slow pathway modification, Uzo, what, what sign do we normally look for that we're doing something positive for this arrhythmia? Um, we like to see distinct, we wanna to start to see distinct uh, P's from the V's. So we wanna see that the AH interval has widened. No, no, we because don't want to that. If the AH interval were to widen during radio frequency current, that would potentially mean that we're injuring the AV node, right? So what we like to see is junctional acceleration. Junctional. So we look for junctional. And yes. then once we, I know, because once you do see junctional, you always start scream to Josie to stop. That's correct. I scream to Josie to stop. So when we see junctional rhythm, which is what's happening here. So let's just look through the his briefly. So here's an AH and V, an AH and V. Now the AH seems to be getting harder to tell, but it's probably because the AH interval is shortening, which probably reflects the fact that the his is starting to accelerate. Also, you notice that this, this R to R interval is much shorter than this one. So this is already, we're getting some junctional acceleration. Then here, we have a hiss and a V, but no A. Now, I, it's hard to tell, right? Because some of this could be A. And if you're not used to looking at these tracings, I completely understand that. But these two beats here are slow junctional beats that we're seeing with uh, delivery of RF current. So Josie appropriately quickly starts A pacing at a rate faster than the junctional rate in order to confirm that during RF delivery, we have a normal AV conduction. Um, which is what we have traditionally done. Many electrophysiologists would say that if there is ventriculoatrial conduction during junctional rhythm for an RF slow pathway modification, that you can feel reasonably confident that there is AV conduction. That is not generally either my opinion or Barry Love's opinion. We both believe that you should A pace during junctional rhythm in order to confirm because you can have ventriculoatrial conduction 
in the same person who has atrioventricular block. So in other words, the presence of VA conduction during junctional rhythm does not guarantee the presence of AV conduction. And so we start a pacing in order to know that the AH and V intervals are not changing while we're delivering radio frequency currents. So sometimes we'll just stop pacing, stop RF. When we see the junctional, we'll then ask Josie to pace the atrium and then we'll go back on so that we can monitor the AH the whole time. Other times, as in this case, Josie just started a pacing after only two or three junctional beats, confirming that AV conduction was normal. Either is a reasonable approach. Now, interestingly, just for completeness sake, I'll mention that when you do cryoablation for AVNRT, you do not get junctional acceleration. Um, I don't know the answer as to why that is, but you don't. And so um, with cryoablation, what we do is we turn on the freezing uh, te technology, when the catheter is stuck to the endocardium as it does with when you reach minus 70 degrees Celsius, we will then look for inducibility or the presence of dual AV node physiology. Some electrophysiologists will even cryoablate in AVNRT with the idea that when it freezes to the endocardium, the tachycardia should terminate and that it should be safe since the catheter is literally stuck to the heart. So you don't have to worry that the catheter would potentially fly and injure something near the AV node when the very sharp and sudden change from rapid tachycardia to sinus rhythm occurs. Um, I don't, when I do cryoablation, I don't personally do it that way because uh, it still freaks me out to be ablating near someone's AV node in tachycardia if I don't have to. But there are many uh, excellent electrophysiologists who do do that. And uh, some would say that that's a better way to know that it's in the right place uh, than just showing that you don't have dual AV node physiology. But in any event, so this is an RF ablation in the, in the slow pathway. And we like to see a slow junctional rhythm. Notice that this rate is much slower even than the sinus rate, or it's a similar rate to the sinus rate. So this is a nice finding. If it's very rapid junctional rhythm, that's often a sign that we're too close to the hiss and we are risking the possibility of AV node hiss injury. If we see very rapid hiss uh, acceleration, we will also come off very quickly for fear that we're about to get heart block. Okay. And after just one or two of these applications, uh, I'm sorry, we were unable to induce any tachycardia and the patient uh, had no more dual AV node physiology and was uh, and seemed to be better. And so in this particular case, we were able to do the app, do very few applications, very low in, in, in Koch's triangle. And we were very uh, easily able to stop the tachycardia inducibility as well as ablate the slow pathway. Sometimes we're not so lucky but this case was a nice example of uh, meeting all of the nice criteria we like to see in an AVNRT case. Does anybody have any questions about this? Okay. All right, uh, why, don't we do, uh, why don't we do one more? This is a Holter tracing from a 12 year old and um, what did I see uh, what we got here? Let's ask uh, Neha. She's going to be in attending soon. Um, what do you think, Neha, uh, about this tracing? These are not simultaneous. This is uh, two strips from different times on the same patient. Okay, got it. Um, so in the first strip, you see a PQRS. Um, and I guess that's the, the, the deflection is D. Uh, and you see PQRS with every single beat. <clears throat> so this is sinus rhythm in the first strip A. And the second strip, it's really hard to see the QRS, um, but the PR interval seems to be much longer in the B strip. Um, and I think, yeah, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I apologize for interrupting you. Um, in the second strip, it's very hard for me to see the QRS, but the PR is longer. 
and um, yeah, in all the beats, but seems to be conducting, all of them seem to be conducting, conducted with P waves. Um, is there a word, for, is there a term for what first you're- First degree, um, a first degree heart block. Right, right. So this patient has intermittent first degree heart block. And um, can you think of a, uh, a normal physiology that could explain this? Um, normal physiology that why would you have intermittent first yeah. degree heart block? Exactly. Um, and this is not um, thinking. Um, I don't know intermittent, but so you're right. You're you're racking your brains correctly because you're saying care <laughs> of anybody who has PR of four hundred, that's normal. Um, okay. you're right, because most of the time this would be an abnormal finding on a whole thing. Mm -hmm. But only thing that it is possible that could be is that maybe the patient has dual AV node physiology and could be going down slow pathway at certain times and fast pathway at others. Most people with dual AV node physiology, the PR uh, does not vary to this degree at all. Um, so this is distinctly abnormal, but I have rarely seen this in people with dual AV node physiology. They have, a, a, in, you do a halter like this in someone with a history of SVT, and then you take them to the lab and they have all of the findings that we see, that we saw in the last patient. But generally speaking, this would be a worrisome finding and you would want to further evaluate this. And you'd mostly want to know that there's not any higher levels of block than this. Mm -hmm. And I would probably also look for medical causes of first degree AV block, which we've talked about in the past. So, all right, I see. So, and uh, if you don't have, sorry. Um, and in the Holter, if you don't have any tachycardia, then that would be even more worrisome, right? There's no SVT yeah. if you're... I think so, unless, of course, there's a history of SVT, because uh, in a 24-hour halter, we certainly might miss SVT, right? Patients don't have True. SVT. Okay, so, um, but it is, this would be a worrisome finding for sure, the same patient. So. All righty, uh, I think we have conference in just a few minutes. Thanks, guys, for joining, and uh, I'll see you in just a few minutes then. Take care.